Thanks. Kind of along the, along the lines that Ronnie and uh, Jim were talking about, you know, this um, it's been a good week because I, I got to talk to some of our former players, guys I haven't heard from in like five years. And um, we, had, we had a speaker come in on Monday and talk to our team, a guy named Clint Bruce, and he's a former Navy SEAL, runs a couple companies now, but he talked about um, the difference between being excellent and being elite. He said, you can, only be, you can only be five things. You can be bad, average, good, excellent, or elite. The only five things you can be. And the difference between excellent and elite is excellence, being excellent is, is measurable. Like excellence is a place on the map, but elite is this, is this mythical place where giants tread. And so we're all, all of us, while you're today, all, we're all trying to be elite. We're all trying to be elite. And, and the other thing that stuck with me is he said, to our players and our coaches, and I've asked myself, I walked around, he spoke Monday night, I walked around all day Tuesday and repeated this to myself probably 300 times, what's your why? What's, what's your why? So why in life, and as a coach, what's your why? And so for me, you know, prof I, I have a personal why and I have a professional why. But the professional why, and like Ronnie alluded to was, for me is physically and mentally develop young men and win championships. Because I, you know, I, the win championships has to be part of it. Because if we don't win championships, I won't have an opportunity to physically and mentally develop young men. But the primary goal or reason I coach and a lot of you coach is for that reason: to physically and mentally develop young men. So when, when the stress of the job, the stress of being in Michigan, when you're being pulled in ten different directions, when you get this recruit, that recruit, this problem, that problem, you got to have a. A North Star, right? And you gotta you gotta have something you look to and say, okay, this is why I'm doing it. Okay, and as a, our players, we talked to our I talked to our players, you know, if your if your goal as a player is to get a degree and win championships, then why are you skipping class? And why why did you go out drinking Saturday night? What is that how does it is that the degree part or is that the championship part? Help me not how does that fit in? And so as a coach, the same for us, right? We gotta have a North Star. That when the stress of the job and everything's overwhelming, why are we doing what we're doing? And a guy, you know, Jake Talanu, who's sitting in the front row, Jake played for us at San Diego State. About a half hour ago, I'm standing out there, my man walks through the door. I don't even know he's coming. He flew from San Diego last night just come to this conference. But that guy's like, that's why we do it. To impact guys, Jake wants to be a spring coach. So that is the reason for me of why we do what we do. Okay, and I think it's we spend way too many hours on our job not to impact lives. Okay, just if, our, if, you're, if your goal is strength coach, just hey, we got to win games, it's going to be miserable. Because I've, I've lost a lot more games than I've won in the last 16 years. So there's got to be a reason. Okay, today we're going to talk a little bit about power development. i got a couple slides first. One about injuries. And this is us talking. Tim Wakeham's in the bad here, so, uh, strength coach at Michigan State. Th this is what keeps me up at night injuries. When we lose our linebacker to an ACL in practice, that keeps me up multiple nights. <coughs> but this, this is on youth sports. I don't know if there's any high school coaches or uh, guys who train high school in the audience, guys or gals. But James Andrews, uh, five to seven fold increase in, in injury rates in youth sports. Many of these kids now have mature type injuries, like 12 year old traveling pitchers with Tommy John injuries, having Tommy John surgery. It never used to happen. Why? Specialization, training kids like the professionals. And he recommends at least two months off each year to recover from the sport, preferably three to four months. I think a lot of our issues, uh, you know, guys are bigger, stronger, faster, I get it. But a lot of it is is they don't have time off. I mean, our guys don't get much time off, so we've got to be smart as strength coaches and to not overtrain these, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Science-based programs, okay? And, and obviously, a lot of us base what we do off science. We read a study, we like what it says, we, but solely based, because I've heard strength coaches say our program is strictly based off science, okay? If your program is strictly based off science, you have to be willing to change your program every two to three weeks. Because that's how quickly science comes out. So I get, at the first of every month, I get 50 studies emailed to me. Biomechanics, anatomy, physiology, physical therapy, nutrition. Every month, a study contradicts the previous month, okay? So as a strength coach, What's, you know, special warfare community. These guys in training burn 10,000 calories a day at the height of their training, and they take in about 8,000. Science says you lose weight. These guys come out about eight pounds heavier in lean body mass. 
Science says that shouldn't be. It doesn't work, right? It doesn't add up, but it does. So, so what sets you apart is having knowledge of science. We base our program off scientific principles, but also pragmatic experience, practical experience. That's strength of Okay, this, and, and this is, um, for you guys, I've spoken about six clinics this, this spring, I think this has been part of every clinic, because um, this is fascinating to me. And I, and, I, and I actually read this study, after a team run last summer, I read the study to our players. So, that, so this is a study on fatigue, because we really, no one, if someone says, yeah, we know exactly why you get fatigued in line, we don't really know, science really doesn't know why we get fatigued. Okay, so Archibald Hill, this is a long time ago, he's a physiologist, he had the lactic acid model, a peripheral model of fatigue. We built up lactate, okay? But what we do know is this, that acidosis has little or no effect on muscular contractions and mammals. Little to none. It's there for a reason, in fact, it's helpful. Okay, so that's Archibald Hill, then, then uh, this, is, this is by Noakes, obviously, it, it's uh, cited in your study. But Noakes comes along, and, and he doesn't buy into this. He, he buys into a more central model of fatigue, he said it's regulated uh, in, anticipation, in anticipation specifically to ensure that no biological failures can occur. So as we get fatigued and we get tired, the brain shuts the body down, right? Okay, so it's not a physical event, but an emotion, okay? So in the final stages of the race, as many as 60, and we're talking about a marathon, trap, whatever it is, as many as 65% of the muscle fibers and the lean athlete's legs are inactive and don't contribute to the effort. Why? Because brain generates sensations of fatigue, place a movable limit on performance. That means, through, and we're, we talk to you guys do the same thing. You talk to your team about mental toughness. So, movable limit on performance. So here's his conclusions. In the case of a close finish, physiology does not determine who wins. He suggests that because of the sensations of fatigue, the brains of the second place finishers accept defeat in the final stage. Okay. Winner, the winner is the athlete whom defeat is the least acceptable rationalization, who's able to withstand the unpleasant feelings of fatigue and the most successful. The winner of the race is the guy who's more mentally tough. Okay? I, I, give that to, I, I make sure our players understand that because as much as we talk about mental toughness, look, and I don't, this, look, this study might be, it might be bogus. I don't care. It's, it's a study that I'm going to read to our kids, right, to, to let them know, hey, the stuff that we're talking about is not... We don't just make this stuff up, okay? You can place a movable limit on performance with this, from the neck up, neck down versus neck up training, okay? So what's our philosophy? In short, maximize street, speed, strength, and power, and minimize orthopedic stress to the body. Obviously, certain exercises pose more inherent risks than other exercises. If you're doing depth jumps off of boxes high, that's a lot more dangerous than jumping off the chair, okay? So speed, strength, and power minimize the orthopedic stress on the body. We're going to demand investment from our players. We, the, our feeling is that workouts, at some point in that workout, they're going to have to dig down mentally and physically to complete it. Not every day. Not every day is a physical test. Okay? But we will demand investment. We're going to coach our coaches those things. Technique, effort, discipline, accountability, and tough. These, to me, these are the X factors right here. Effort, discipline, accountability. <coughs> we all talk about it. But it has to be coached every day. Okay? Motivation. How do we motivate our kids? Number one, if you're not training, and we, we don't have a bunch of rules in our program. We don't have weight room rules. We don't have a, a whole book of the rules in our football program. We have standards. Okay, so there's a difference. We don't have a bunch of rules. We have standards. If you don't meet those standards, you don't have to wear our gear. I don't have to. I don't have to give you anything. You come play football in Michigan and wear a white T-shirt and some Bermuda shorts to train. If you want, we we don't owe you a thing. Okay. So if you want to wear our clothes, Michigan football, then then you train to our standards. And if you don't, you wear a red shirt. Red's the one color you don't wear in our building. Okay. So we have red shirts say accountability. So if I deem you unaccountable, our seniors deem you unaccountable, you wear a red shirt until you are accountable and, and can wear what we wear. We have a victor's board. It has three categories. Um, one, is, one says UCAD, U-C-A-D. That's uh, unaccountable, uh, uncommitted, unaccountable, and disciplined. Mm -hmm. Then we have a conveniently committed category. Then we have a victorious warrior category. And at the end of two weeks, myself, uh, Coach Corral, and my assistants, we sit down and we rate guys. Based solely, not upon strength gains, all that, but based solely on effort. 
your attitude, your effort, your leadership. And you're in that category for those three weeks. Then we do before and after photos of our guys. Okay? We don't, you're not, I, I'm not going to talk about any exercises you guys haven't seen. We use basic progressive exercises. Okay? The one thing that I ask our staff is, is that we're prepared. So if we have a 6 o'clock lift group, we have a staff meeting at 4.30. 4.30, I usually get in at 3.30. Uh, get myself in line. We have a staff meeting at 4.30 to make sure that we're all on the same page, the white room set up. Because our guys, 6 o'clock lift group, our first guy is going to roll in at 5 and sometimes a little before 5. The whole group should be there by 5.30. So we have, we have to make sure we're prepared. Otherwise, I can't ask our players to be prepared if we're not as a staff. Okay, so power development. So here's, the, here's kind of the things we're going to talk about today. We're going to define it, what exercises are best for producing power. And okay, we're going to talk a little bit about post-activation potentiation, just something you can add to your program that doesn't take equipment. Uh, it can be added fairly easy. It, doesn't, it increases the density of the workout. It doesn't necessarily take more time in the workout. And then we'll talk about how we program a typical off-season. Okay? So one, the difference between strength and power. Okay? So strength is the maximum force you can generate against resistance, regardless of time, regardless of the speed component. Okay? Now power, the only difference is we added a time interval. So the maximum amount of force you can generate in the shortest amount of time. So essentially, uh, power is force and velocity. So if you want to increase power, you can A, get stronger, or B, get faster, or you can do both. Okay? Every athlete, regardless of sports, is going to need some level of power. So, he, he, you know, Louis Simmons, even a marathon needs to sprint to the finish line. But power, power is the one variable, the quality that's going to separate your athletes from other athletes. Okay? So this, this has to be developed. Now, we're, we're going to talk about high school athletes versus college. But it, it's the one variable that's going to make a marked difference in your athletes. So it has to be discussed. Okay, now, <clears throat> here's what we've got to understand is that a fundamental relationship exists between strength and power. So your athletes that are stronger possess more favorable neuromuscular characteristics for power production because p power is force and velocity, right? So if velocity is here and you've got athletes, some of your athletes, that, like we'll do some testing on our guys that we'll talk about, and if we got a fast kid who's not very strong, we don't have to train speed that much or rate of force from We can work the strength end, the strength side of that equation and increase power development, okay? But the strength will always dictate the upper level to produce power. Because who cares how quickly you can generate force if ultimately that force production is so low it's, it's irrelevant. You have to have, so, so power is built on this foundation of strength. And, you're, and at, younger athletes that aren't real strong don't have to do an inordinate amount of power training to become powerful. You're kind of putting the cart before the horse. Get them strong first. A solid level of strength help, uh, uh, covers a lot of aspects now with change of direction, agility, power, speed. So get them stronger first, okay? Understand that your choice of exercises will lead to these velocity specific adaptations. So <clears throat> if you have, you know, uh, college athletes like, like I do, and all they've done is squat heavy for the last <laughs> eight years, you will improve the high force, low velocity portion of the curve. And actually, if you continue to do this, you will get stronger athletes who become slower <clears throat> because they have more to the other side of the force velocity curve. This has been documented. I mean, if all we do is heavy, slow strength training, we will get good at heavy, slow work. Okay? The other side, the light loads, improve the low force, high velocity portion of the curve, but not the high force area of the curve. So we have to work both sides. Within a week, within a block, within a trip, however you organize workouts, both sides of that force velocity curve have to have to be uh, adjusted, uh, uh, trained. Okay, so here's the force velocity curve. And this is old hat for most of them. Okay, so in, so in here we have this side to the left of the curve. We have maximal strength, and then as you go and the force decrease and velocity increases, we get the strength, speed, power, speed, strength, and then ultimately speed to the right of that force velocity curve. Okay, but here's the power relationship. So we still have the same force velocity curve. Okay, but here's a power curve. Okay, so we got to find for our, if we if we have a block where we're training at max power, we need to find it. And it's different for everyone. That's why no study's real conclusive on hey, what weight should we train within the jump squat to create the most power? They're all all over the board, somewhere between maybe 30 percent to 60 percent, because every athlete is different. 
And so for that athlete, we have to find where does he create max peak, max power? Where does that happen? And we do this a couple of ways. One, we have Kaiser equipment. We have a Kaiser air squat where we can do it in less than 60 seconds on that equipment. Otherwise, if you're gonna if you're gonna look at where do I, where does he create max P with a hand clean, start at 135 and increase in 20 pound increments until you see and you have to hook them up to a tendo unit or a force plate until you see power peak and then go down, then you got max speed. It's more time consuming. Okay? But so this so this is the, the power curve. So as force decreases, power increases to a certain point and then force becomes too low. So in other words, if I squat 400 pounds, that's my max squat. And I put 390 on the bar, it's high force, but remember power is force and velocity, but it's low velocity, so I won't get max speed. But if I decrease it to 360, power climbs. I decrease it to 330. But somewhere in there, maybe 60%, around 240 pounds, the stars align and I get max P. And if I keep dropping weight, the velocity keeps increasing, but my force production is low enough that the power declines. Okay, so that's what we're talking about with this where if we're in a max power phase, we have to find max power for our athletes, and we train a max power at that weight, and we try to push power for those three or four weeks, okay? But that's the relationship between force, velocity, and power, okay? Now, here's what happens with your athletes when you train. So this is, this solid line is an untrained individual, okay? That's their force time and their power group, okay? If we do explosive ballistic training, that's that line, that's this line right here, okay? You can see what happens is, and this is, a, this is a time, 200 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds. So if you take an untrained individual, train them with, high, with uh, low force, high velocity exercises solely, okay? You've increased, you've increased the force production at all these time intervals, okay? And maximum strength climbs too. Maximum strength actually goes up a little bit, okay? If you train them with heavy resistance training, at 200 milliseconds, they don't look a whole lot different, okay? Now, when you guys are sprinting at top speed, ground contact time at a foot is about 100 milliseconds. So it's different acceleration. I'm talking about top speed, 90 to 100 milliseconds. Your athletes have to apply force to the ground and move on to the next stride. So this time interval becomes critical. So that's explosive ballistic strength training. And obviously there's a difference right from the beginning. 100 milliseconds is there, okay? There's not a, the, the heavy resistance, there's no difference at 100 milliseconds between trained and untrained. It now, you start, it starts becoming apparent at 200 and climbs. Obviously, the longer, if I'm doing heavy strength training, the longer time frame you give me to develop force, the more force I can develop, okay? Which is why this thing starts taking off at 500 milliseconds. But that's what it looks like. You take an untrained individual, heavy resistance training, light explosive, and that's what you're gonna get. For us, we want both, right? We want the best of both worlds. So we have to, over time, in a training block, whatever it is, we have to train them both high force, low velocity, and on the other side of the curve, the low force, higher velocity. So examples, high force, low velocity, or squat, squat variations, front squat, back squat, box squats, squats with chains, whatever your choice of exercise is, hex bar deadlifts, low force, high velocity, a Kaiser squat. Now, Kaiser squat, we can go anywhere from 20 pounds to, I think it goes to 800 pounds. So we can choose anyone that curve we're gonna train with that. But Olympic variations, you know, full cleans, hand cleans, snatches, Okay, clean jerks, hex bar power pull, which we'll show you, squat jumps, kettlebell swings, on and on and on, okay? So one of the best exercises for developing power, okay? Now this is um, Swinton study, 19 male power lifters. Okay, he did a hex bar speed deadlift. And I, you guys are familiar with the hex bar, trap bar, stand in the middle of it, handles in neutral position. Speed deadlift, and, and these are, now these are, for those of you who are familiar with tendo units and force blades, this is peak power. And peak power is always going to be higher than average power. Okay? But these are peak power averages. 4,800 watts and individual outputs as high as 6,100 watts in the hex bar or trap bar speed deadlift from a stop position on the floor to full speed. Okay? Now, uh, Prue Corme, Winchester, they've reported these. But again, we're comparing peak power to peak power, so it's okay. We're not comparing peak to average. Peak power for the power clean, average is 4,200 compared to 48. Uh, highest was 4,900 compared to 6,100. Okay? So that gives you a little insight on that. So, but we also have to keep in mind that performing traditional exercises with the hopes of improving power like a speed bench press are counterproductive. 
because if I do a bench press and uh, and I've done believe me, I've done I've done speed bench press before, but what happens is if if you put 135 pounds on a bar and say accelerate this bar as fast as you can, the first 50 percent of the movement is in acceleration, the last 50 is in deceleration. Why? Because if you continue to accelerate, that sucker's going to leave your hand. And that's not a big deal, but what is a big deal when that thing comes back down, you got to catch it. That's a big deal, right? So you can't perform a traditional exercise, a speed squat, for instance, same thing. If you continue to accelerate, your feet are going to leave the ground. Not a big deal. When you land with 225 on your shoulders, that is a big deal. Okay? Again, same researcher looked at power, compared power pull to barbell squat jumps. And barbell squat jumps have been used, if you read studies on power, they use a barbell squat jump a lot. Because you get some high, high power outputs with barbell squat jumps. So hex bars in red, uh, straight bar squat jump is in blue. They trained at 20, 40, and 60 percent of one rep max. Okay, and those are the power outputs. So hex bar trumps straight bar at all percentages except for zero body weight. Okay. Another study in 2005, and this is just to kind of get you guys to do hand cleans, power cleans. Where where do we train? The highest power output they found was 70% of a one rep max power in the handling. So do we have to go to 90 and do heavy singles? Probably not. I mean, we, when we do hand cleans and hook tendo units too, we know that we know that guys can, can complete a hand clean in about 1.0 meters per second, but we want them to really move to 1.4. But you can do it slower, but again, power is force and velocity, so if we're moving it that slow, are we creating power? Are we developing power? And other studies have shown intensities between 50 and 90 percent of your one rep max are not significantly different in power outputs. Because you don't have to train guys at 90 percent in Olympic movements to get bang for your buck. Another study, 2007, same thing, 50 to 90 percent. So this, so this graph represents a study in 2011. Okay, they used 60 percent of their one rep max power clean for all these exercises, and they comp they compared these four exercises. They did a power clean, 60 percent. They did a hand clean at 60%. They did a mid-thigh clean right from here, catching it, and then a mid-thigh clean pull where they didn't catch it. They just performed the hip extension move part. And look at the power outputs. Okay? So mid-thigh clean pull wins, right? So if based on that, if we, want, if we want to see how do we produce the most power, we're going to go right to that, right? Rate of force development, same thing. All shoot at the same study, 60%. This is just looking at set of power, rate of force development, as you would guess, mid-thigh clean pull uh, wins again. So here's what we did. So we have, we have two force plates, okay? And force plates are, are awesome, okay? Expensive, but awesome. Because we can put athletes on there, and we can do a vertical jump. And we can look at how much force they can create at 100 milliseconds in the jump. We can compare uh, right leg to left leg jumps and look at peak torque, peak power, rate of force development. We can look at when they land, what's it look like when they land, the force in the plate. We can look at when they jump, how far do they move center of mass before they accelerate. We can look at how long are they, we can look at all these things, and we can look at a pre-injury, then when a guy gets hurt post-injury, okay, where are you at? Because post-injury, guys will come back, and the trainers will say, man, he looks good, doesn't he? And we put him on the force plate, and he's 50% of rate of force development in 100 milliseconds. He's not ready. He's not ready to go yet, but, but so we're continuing put our athletes on there and just forget about, um, for me, I like reading studies, but let's, let's just find out what, about our athletes. I don't want to know about the, the rugby team in Australia. I'd rather, let me know about uh, Thomas Gordon and Brennan Byer. So we took two athletes, athlete A and B, put them on a force plate. So we, we did uh, those four exercises. We did a counter movement jump, which is a vertical <laughs> jump, right? Body weight was hands on the hips, and then we put uh, loads on our back. We did we did uh, bar 65, 85, 105, 125 pounds, and we did hand cleans at those weights there. We did hand clean pre clean pull at those weights there, and then we did a hex ball power pull. Now the caveat to this is the hex bar power pull, unlike the hand clean where we got a counter movement and a counter movement jump, we had nothing with the hex bar power pull. We had to start from a dead stop. That that reduces power output. Okay. But th those were the, that's what we got. So that, that's a body weight squat jump, no arms, peak power. That's hand clean. And at 155 pounds, again, we went all the way up, and that, we just, we're, we're showing where he created the most power, 155. That's a hand clean pull with the same weight. And then that's a hex bar power pull with 185 pounds. 
So it's a little bit higher than the hang plane, less than the hang plane pull. But if we were able to measure a counter movement, if we were able to take that hex bar and down and up, you'd see a higher power output with the hex bar. Okay, athlete B, similar. Same test, that squat jump, he recorded the highest power output, not with body weight, but with an empty bar, 45 pounds. That's hex bar power pull 185, trumped even the hand clean pull at 225. Power outputs, okay? So my, what's, what's my goal in saying this? Are there exercises better than others? Yes and no, I mean, it's up to you as a coach. I'm just saying there are, there are several exercises that create a bunch of power. That's it, do we do hand clean? Just really. Do we do hex bar power pull? You bet. Okay. Do we elevate it on blocks and get them more in a hand? Absolutely. Do we do squat jumps? Absolutely. There's a lot of exercise you can do to create power. You don't have to be locked into one exercise. This is what we're going to do to create power. Okay. So this is uh, hex bar power pull we're talking. If you recognize that guy, it's because he's sitting right there. But straight off the ground, no counter movement. Up, extend, right? Extend ankles, knees, hips, shrug at the top. Okay, this same thing, slow motion. Okay, we, we get them in a good position, flat back, chin square, boom, straight up. And you see, I don't know if you guys don't see it, little, and we, we try to be very vigilant, <coughs> almost militaristic in how we coach. So right there, you saw his butt pop up just a little bit first. In slow motion, you can see it better. I don't like that as well. And so if we get a guy who's taller, because everyone's a little bit different height, we can put him on pads and elevate it. <laughs> Okay, do the same movement from pads, and it's a little bit cleaner, right? Still a little bit, still lower than a hand clean, okay? Same movement, slow motion, a little bit cleaner. But again, once we're in a good position here, we're not worried about a catch. We're just worried about taking that sucker and exploding off the ground, okay? Now, if you don't have force plates and you don't have tender units, how do you calculate power? And there are several equations. This is what we use. And here's why I think it's important. Because if you have a 200 pound athlete, 6 foot 200 pound, and 6 foot 225 pound athlete, and a 200 pounder jumps, has a 32 inch vertical, as you met, how you measure verticals, vertex, uh, jump mat, whatever you use. But the second athlete only has 30, it's easy for us as coaches to say, you know what? That sucker creates more power. Because right, his vertical jump is a measure of power, and he jumps two inches higher, he creates more power. But when you take into a factor force, because athlete B weighs more, he's creating more force, peak power there, peak power there. So the guy who jumps 30 actually creates more power than the guy who jumps 32 inch vertical. That's why I feel like it's important that not only, I mean, you can measure verticals, that tells part of the story, okay? It tells how high they jump, but what about their power outputs? And if you don't have force plates, you don't have tendo units, that's an easy way to do it. Set up an Excel file, all you need is their height and weight, and their uh, height they jump, and you've got power outputs. Okay. And again, that is a, this is a peak power equation, but you've also got an average power. So average power is, if I get down here from the time I start the movement till I leave the ground, average power over that distance. Peak is any, any incremental, you know, if I take power any increment in that whole movement, what's the peak? And obviously the peak would be right before I left the ground. That's the difference between the two measurements. But again, it's, a way, it's just another variable that you can show your athletes. And what if, what if you bring in the training center or high school or college and your athlete's vertical jump only went up a half inch? He goes, Coach, what's going on, man? I'm doing all this work, I'm trying to create power, I'm trying to improve my explosiveness. And my vertical only went up a half inch. But you also look back and say, okay, you gained 10 pounds, your power output went up 500 watts. And he said, oh, okay, I get it now. Okay, so here's a uh, synopsis of ours. Okay, number one, and, and some guys, I know coaches who perform power movements at the end of a session because we have to be powerful in the fourth quarter. I get that. We can easily make an argument for that. Uh, it's just not what I do. I, mean, I want to perform power after a warm, to begin a workout, when their ability to create power is at the highest. Okay? We don't do any more than three reps per set. Okay? Again, <coughs> some guys do sets of 10 power planes. That's your deal. Go ahead and do it. It's just telling you what we do. What we found is on, through all of our tendo testing, through testing on the Kaiser squat, if you're going all out, doing sets of four or five, after about the third rep, power drops below 90% of your peak power, and that, at that point we need to cut the set off. So once we get below 90%, excuse me, once we get below 90%, we're no longer working on power. We're no longer, fatigue has become too much of a factor. 
Now you may be working on uh, endurance, power endurance, as some people call it, but not pure power. So we're, we're typically sets of three or less. Okay? We train both maximal strength, and this is really the take home. There's only one thing you write down from the whole clinic, it's that. You need to train both max strength and max sp and speed strength in a manner that allows for optimal rest, recovery, and adaptation to occur. Two frequent sessions, right? Rest is not optimal, adaptation doesn't occur, in fact, everything happens, okay? Certain exercises are better suited than others in, in, in uh, an explosive push-up as opposed to a bench press, okay, because I can accelerate through the full range of motions. Now, this is, this is interesting. Now, actual speed versus the intent to move. Because this study was done in 93 uh, in sale, where what they proposed and what they found is, okay, is it really, do I really have to move way fast? Or neuromuscularly, can I just have the intention of moving it fast? So in other words, if I put 90% of my bench press max on the bar, and I'm trying to move that sucker as fast as I can, but it's not moving fast, does the outward speed have to actually be fast, the bar speed? Or neuromuscularly, as long as I'm intending to move it fast, is that enough? And so, the, so they did a study, okay? So McBride, here's what they did. They, they had two groups, athletic men with the subjects. Group A, you guys, you train with 30% of, of your uh, squat max, okay? And accelerate as fast as you can. 30%, no heavier. Group B, you train with 80%. So essentially, you've got a low force, high velocity group, and then a high force, low velocity group, right? Then they tested these. Pre and post. Agility test, they did a 20 meter sprint, and then they did jump squats at 30, 55, and 80. We're done pre and post. Now, logic, before you even look at the results, logic would say, okay, I'll bet the guys who train with 30 uh, were really good at 30 and not good at that, right? You get what you train for. And the guys who train with 80 were really good at 80 and not good at that. Here's the results the 30 group, they improve velocity capabilities regardless of the load. So they train at 30%, they improve velocity capabilities at 30 at 55 and even at 80% of their one rep max. Never used, never went above 30, okay? That didn't happen in the 80 groups. Did not happen, okay? The 80 groups showed improved force capabilities with no effect or even, like I talked about at the beginning, at the beginning of the topic, where I said if you train heavy weight, you will get good at heavy weight, but you will uh, lose velocity. That's what happened, okay? So, in some cases, negative effect on velocity capabilities. So, in other words, they improved force capabilities here, but not velocity, and they got worse here. They got worse at 30. They couldn't, they couldn't create velocity. So they improved their agility times. Okay, Why? Because when I cut, how long that foot's on the ground a long time? If I'm, if I'm sprinting, I don't have much time to create max force. Right, My foot's on the ground very short. But if I run and I cut, I can use my strength, redistribute force, and explode out. So they, they, got, they did well at agility, but performed worse. Not the same, but worse than the 20 meter sprint. Okay? So, what they said, heavy resistance training may increase initial acceleration when velocity is slow. Worse than the sprint. But light resistance increases acceleration capabilities during higher velocity. Okay? And this is uh, correlated with another study, okay? Schmidt Bleicher, recent study. Squat max correlates well, first, first 15 meters of sprinting in high school athletes. Okay, where velocity is a little bit lower. So acceleration, and uh, a guy that I'm working with has told me before, you know, and a guy who, who coaches elite tracks athletes said, the squat will help probably the first two to four steps, and, and that's all he believes it will help. In a sprint. Right. Obviously, we're not talking about getting strong. Squat's a great exercise. But in a sprint, if you're, if you're correlating squat to sprinting, correlates very well with the initial acceleration, but not much, not as well with top speed. Right. <laughs> Post activation potentiation. For us, this is used in our power phase. It's a way to increase workout density and not have them in the weight room any longer than we would have. Okay, so in other words, if you, if you have a three minute rest interval between sets of squats, it's okay that you can knock out a couple of vertical jumps and it won't take time away from the workout. But essentially, what this is, okay, scientific, it, it's uh, post activation potentiation is induced by a voluntary conditioning contraction performed at maximum or near maximum intensity. In other words, a, a set of two squats at 80%. That's, that's what we're talking about, a conditioning contraction. It's been shown to increase both peak force and rate of force development during subsequent twitch contractions. In other words, if we do a barbell squat, 80%, and then do a weighted vertical jump, our vertical jump, we will be able to jump higher because of the potentiation from the barbell squat. 
Okay, that's essentially what this says. Or a hex bar powerful into a vertical jump. Okay, so these performance characteristics are acutely enhanced because of their contractile history. Okay, for the uh, 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 the barbell squat number of reps and then the time before you take them into the vertical. We're gonna get jump. into that. All right. Short answer. We don't know for sure. <laughs> okay, but we're gonna get into that. Okay. So here's here's why it works. And I'm not gonna spend any time on that. There's three theories of why it works. Scientific theory of why post activation potentiation works. It's all in your notes, we don't have to cover it. Here's non scientific. We perform three to five rep max, followed by light explosive set to your nervous system. It's like lifting a half can of water you think is full. We've all done it. Okay? That's what post activation potentiation allows you to do. Okay? So here's what we need to know. The conditioning contraction has to be greater, equal to or greater than 80% of your dynamic or isometric, MVC is max voluntary contraction. We don't have to worry about isometric. I, mean, I, don't, I don't. I don't do much isometric work. But so it's got to be 80% above 80. Okay? You get this, and I'm going to show you this graph, you get this peak activation immediately after Immediately after conditioning contraction, it instantly begins to increase. The problem is fatigue is also present immediately after conditioning contraction. Okay? And in the early stages, obviously, you do a set of squats, and we'll keep using that as, as our example. Fatigue is more dominant early, right? Right when you rack the bar up, you're fatigued, and fatigue dissipates as you go through the rest interval. Okay? But it subsides at a faster rate than fat. So the, there's these two windows, essentially. Okay, and it's on the next slide where you can realize that activation potentiation. But, it, but you have to balance this, okay? So it's this balance between fatigue and activation that will determine if that subsequent contraction is uh, above baseline, okay, if it's improved. So here are the two windows. Window one, immediately after. So this is PAP, this is fatigue. PAP is a little bit higher than fatigue immediately after, although fatigue is present. Okay? And in window two, when fatigue starts to dissipate and you still have some potentiation remaining. Okay? Now, here's what, to answer your question, here's what affects the, this relationship. There's five things. The volume of the conditioning contraction. In other words, how many sets did you do? How many reps did you do? And what is your rest interval between? You know, if you're going to do six sets of eight squats and expect to do and rest a minute in between, and expect to jump higher in vertical jump, we all know that's silly. That you'll be too fatigued, right? But if you do two sets of two squats with three minutes in between to 80%, it's more realistic, right? The intensity of contraction, in other words, we've just said they gotta be above 80%. You're, you're gonna squat 60% of your max, that's not enough to potentiate the CNS to, to realize a higher vertical jump. The type, dynamic or isometric, the subject, you, your athletes, your, your, the subject characteristics of your athletes matters, okay? I, I got 10 minutes, okay? And the type of activity, so let's, let's get through this. I want to talk about how, kind of how we program this, okay? So here's a study. Did three sets of three isometric contractions, okay? Peak torque increase, but decreased significantly after five sets of three. It's only six seconds longer total work, but decreased so. So we don't know for sure. Okay, so the specific recovery period has yet to be determined, but I'll promise you guys that if you do this with your athletes and you watch a set, you'll know intuitively who needs a little more rest and who doesn't. You'll be able to figure this out, okay? Um, the type of conditioning contraction, there's not a clear relationship between dynamic and isometric. Again, we don't, uh, we don't do a ton of isometric, so we don't have to worry about that. One thing we did have a lot of success with and we typically use one to three reps, 85 to 90, and then immediately, and I say immediately, zero to 60 seconds, followed by explosive activity. And we've had a lot of success increasing guys' verticals with this right here. We'll do a hex bar deadlift, concentric only. Okay, so we'll get them in position, lift, boom, drop. Get set, lift, drop, go right over to the vertex or jump mat, two vertical jumps. Okay, and we don't run, we don't get from point A to sprint to point B and jump. Take your time, walk over there about 30 seconds, we jump, or we jump, okay? Really like that uh, complex or combination, okay? Subject characteristics matter. So, and this is, this is important. 4.0% increase, counter movement is just a vertical jump. 
after five sets of back squats and those who could squat 350 pounds or more. But those who could not squat 350 pounds, look at the increase, 10 times less. So we know that there's a strength component. In other words, for your, maybe if you're a high school strength coach or college, if you've got guys who aren't real strong, they probably don't need this. If you want to differentiate, differentiate your athletes and have your older guys do something a little bit different, your young guys do something a little bit different than that, to me, 4% increase, I mean, I, that's a waste of my time. Okay? <clears throat> I mean, a point four, four percent will take that. Okay. Um, there's also a correlation um, in fiber type distribution. They think that people with fast switch fibers may respond a little bit better to this. Okay. Um, also, the training level. So athletes who are accustomed to training have higher resistance to fatigue, generally respond better. Okay. Now here's how we implement it. Okay. We may do a heavy bench press into a med ball throw or plow push-up. And I have select athletes only. The plow push-up, our, our 300 pound uh, lineman who's not very strong, there's nothing plyometric about the push-up he's about to do, okay? It's too slow, so he'll do a med ball throw. We get a skilled athlete who can explode off the ground and get some height, that, that's more suited to him, okay? Squats or hex bar deadlift with vertical jumps, split jumps, uh, straight bar deadlift or RDL into sprints or broad jumps. Now, a slide that I skipped over, uh, the kinematics of these things matter, right? So if I want to increase the height of my vertical, okay, I like to do an axially loaded exercise with a vertical component like a squat, like a hex bar deadlift, maybe a heavy clean because that kinematically more resembles a vertical jump. If I want to do a horizontal, like more horizontal component like a broad jump, you may want to use a, uh, an RDL, an exercise that has a little bit more of a horizontal component to it to potentiate. Okay, so here's our here's our summer template. Okay, it's what and we just finished week one, so we're right in the middle of this phase right here. Some people call it hypertrophy phase. Uh, we don't use traditional uh, periodization with hypertrophy into a strength into a, we don't we use more of a block approach, which is a whole another discussion. But anatomical adaptation. The goals for this are to prepare our athletes for the training that's going to take place. Uh, after Memorial Day, our four-week strength block. Uh, this is to increase tendon and ligament strength. Uh, whenever we do a phase, if, if, if we're in an anatomical adaptation phase, our sets and reps are a little bit higher. We use a variety of exercise. We push on different planes. Complexes and circuits work good in this phase. But the running and jumping has to complement the strength training. Or if some guys think running and jumping first, and that's fine, the strength training has to complement your running and jumping. In other words, anatomical adaptation phase for us isn't the time to do heavy speed work, okay? Because that, the emphasis is to get us ready for our strength and speed phase, not to perform it right off the bat. So we use submaximal intervals with this, gasters, half gasters. We do a 300-yard shuttle test as our conditioning test, so right now we're on 300-yard shuttles, okay? The jumping, high-frequency, low-amplitude jumps and hops, line jumps, dot drills, quick for ladder jumps. Uh, uh, jumping, as you guys know, when we use the words jump and hop, the jumping, the definition of jumping is well, jump off two feet, land on two feet. Hop is jump off one, land on one. So that's that's the delineation there. So that's that's kind of where we're at right now. Or so, and I'm going to show you kind of a, a whole template. So we'll get into after Memorial Day on max strength phase. So that's weeks three to six, and we use max strength, there, and we use three to five reps in this phase. Okay. The goal obviously is to develop max strength in these upper body pressing movements and compound lower body movements. And why I put that up there is because um, a lot of coaches, I think, when, when we go through a traditional uh, periodization plan, which, like I said, we don't use, um, and really the guy, you know, the, the periodization plan uh, that Matt Baev developed in the 1970s, they quit using about five years later in Europe, and we're still using them 30 years later. But um, a lot of coaches, when they go through hypertrophy phase, label every exercise they do hypertrophy. So cleans, we've got to do sets of 12. And boy, plyos, they must, we must have to do hypertrophy plyos too. And so I put this up there because we're trying to develop max strength in the upper body pressing movements. The, our pulling movements for us, we always pull for the, for the reasons balancing out the anterior shoulder and creating uh, mass in the rear delts, upper back, rhomboids. So our pulling movements don't fit the three to five rep model. That's why I put that on there. Okay, so we train them at three to five rep range. We use relative intensities to program this. So in other words, 
We're on a four-day split, okay? And we bench on Monday and then bench again on Thursday, if we do. We don't use the same intensity. So we may, we may do a, a fi, a five sets of five on Monday, whatever it is. And we may do five sets of five on Thursday, but it might only be 82% of the relative intensity of Monday. Not 82% of our one rep max, but 82% of Monday's intensity, if that makes sense. So same exercise, same volume, lower intensity. Okay. Now, what goes well with the max strength phase? Resistance running. Resistance sprints fits in nicely. Intervals wouldn't. If we're trying to, if you're doing, if you're busting your tail trying to develop max strength, a ton of anaerobic intervals uh, clashes. Right. Uh, that's why you know guys used to do the mile run test. The mile run test clashes. It, it is conflict with what you're trying to get done. Okay. Now, in lower level athletes, you can get better at the mile and a half run, and you can get strong. Okay? As you progress in training age, the increases you're going to make in both those are going to diminish. Okay? So we want to get good in this month of June. We want to get a lot stronger and get good at max strength. Okay? And then what, what fits jumping? Counter movement jump, box jumps, single leg box jumps. Okay? We'll also use some depth jumping. Now there's a difference between uh, depth jumps and drop jumps. Okay? So we may use drop jumps in July. Now, it's, and if you do a Google search on depth jumps versus drop jumps, you're going to get 10 sides. You won't know the difference, and a lot of them are, are wrong. So depth jump, Vera Kershansky was, was the pioneer of plyometrics and depth jumping. A depth jump is uh, typically done 24 to 30 inch box, okay? And the goal of depth jumping is you're not looking at ground contact time. You want to jump off, hit the ground, no matter how long it takes, and jump as high as you can. That's a depth jump, okay? And most of you guys know that. That's a depth jump. The difference between a depth jump and a traditional drop jump is drop jump, and depth jumps are really good at increasing maximal strength and power, which is why it fits in nicely here. If we want to increase the uh, elastic component, the stretch shortening cycle, max speed, we're going to use drop jumps. And we're going to go from a 30 centimeter box or roughly a 12 inch box, okay, and we're going to now ground contact time becomes a factor. And we're going to use jump mats. And now the instructions are jump off, hit the ground as fast as you can, and get as high as you can. Not one or the other. you got to have both. But it puts two times as much force on the musculoskeletal system and the tendons. So that's a high-intensity activity. Death jumps are not as high-intensity. High we jump off, boom, we collect, and we jump. Not as much stress on the tendon and the muscle. Okay? Drop jumps, on the other hand, we're trying to develop max speed. That is more intense. So if you ever read something, the delineation between the two, that's the difference. So depth jumps might be used here. Drop jumps may be used more here. Plyos, okay, typical drop jump. So our power phase, week 7, 8, 9, 10, develop max power in the upper body pressing movements and compound lower. Now, we do have in these four weeks, and, and the last summer was really the first time I really made a commitment to doing this. I got scared because the month of July, we had some guys who didn't lift a heavy weight the whole month of July. All they did was max power work, so to speak. And so I'm going, man, we're going to get weaker. We did. We get stronger. Okay? Uh, and our rate of force is going to improve. So now they, some guys some guys are going to do more strength in July. Some guys are going to do more power movement. Some guys are going to do a combination of both. But that's the goal. We're going to train at max power, or what we call high velocity power is uh, a little bit you know, less than, it's more on the speed side of max B of that power graph. Low velocity power is more on the strength side. Okay? So what works running, what fits running-wise with this is sprints out of a three-point stance or flying 20s, whatever you choose to use. But max speed sprints. And then the jumping would be drop jumps or plyos, but, but this is critical. Less than 0.25 seconds of ground contact time. So if I do, so if, I'm, if you're doing hurdle jumps and, and your athletes are going like this, that's not a plot. That's jumping and landing and jumping and landing. So we have, you know, it's not high tech, they're $400 jump mats. And we and we'll set up we'll set up hurdles this high, then we'll set up some you know those power systems, twelve inch hurdles, then we'll set up some micro hurdles, and then I'll have just a hash mark. Like those guys must not be trying, but but you're jumping hashes today, bro, because you ain't so I don't know what's wrong with you, but you know you're unathletic, have no fast switch you're just not trying, so you jump hashes. But we put jump mats down, and so everyone starts on large hurdles, right? And the lineman jumps over 0 .4, 0 .4, 0 .4, get out. You need a small hurdle. Because you're not we want short ground contact time, we want to work stretch shortening cycle, we want to work speed, and you ain't working speed. So that's how we determine, everyone says, how do you know what? That's how we determine what height to jump over. 
if your ground contact time is above 0.25, that height is too high. Go lower and get off the ground faster. So we'll put jump mats at each, and once we find the sweet spot, you're right there until we feel like you can move up, and then we may, you know, two weeks try to bump you up. But that's how we handle it. Put the jump mats out on the turf, and the coaches are reading, they're calling out times. 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, get out. 0 0.2, 0 0.2, good job. Good job, you may be able to go a little higher. So that, but, but the running and the jumping has to match up with the string training. Or else you're, you're in conflict, right? You're butting heads with what you're doing as a strength coach. So here, this is the last slide. So this is kind of our template. So, uh, and this is last summer. It's more of an eight week as opposed to 10 week. Uh, week one and two, anatomical adaptation, right? And this is the upper body press, okay? Bench press, four sets, eight. Again, it's high reps. And we may do, we may not do bench the second day. We may do a unilateral movement, okay? But it's, so it's bench, single leg lower, barbell squat, and then here's our jumping and running. High volume, low amplitude, interval run. Okay, and, then, and so we develop, so we set rules. I'll set rules for each phase, select exercises, and make sure those exercises and sets and reps adhere to those rules. <coughs> so we, so as a string coach, my template's done. I've just got to, okay, what interval do you want to do? Half gas or gas or whatever. You want to test three narrow shell, three three narrow shell in there. But once you develop a template, it's pretty easy to plug things in. What are we going to test? Are we going to test the bench? Better bench. Now I can test the bench? Pick a press. Pick a press that's going to strengthen us and match strength rate. Okay? Now we did, so, so this was last summer, bench press. We did four sets of five, four sets of four, five sets of three because we're three to five this, this phase. Okay, we squatted the same, five, four, three. This is 90% of Friday squat. So on that Friday, we squatted four sets of five, 75 to 80, and we give the kids... You're going to squat in that range, but if you want to go a little heavier, you can. If you, want, if you feel like you need to stay at 75, that's fine. So this was 90% of that. So my squat max was 400, and I squat 80%. I'm using 320 on Friday. On this day, I'm using 90% of 320, which is 290 and 300 pounds, okay, on that day. So same set, same reps, lower intensity, okay? Then in our power phase, bench press plus post-activation potentiation. I'm, I'm done. I'm good. Okay, so bench press plus, so this day was four sets of 285 to 90 plus med ball throw. So rack the weight up, take your time, get on the ground, partner stands on the bench, drops it, boom, boom, return. Two reps. Okay, now my partner benches, and, and they're going to have three or four minutes in between sets here. Okay? Then we'll do a clean or hex bar power pull variation. Our second press last July was a push press. Okay? And then we did a hex bar deadlift with potentiation, concentric only, with two vertical jumps. Okay, and again, box jumps, single leg box jumps, resisted running, hurdle plyos, sprints, uh, all have to match up, right? Then, so July, in July, we're trying to get these guys in football shape, so we don't just do 10 yard, or 30, 40 yard sprints, we'll do some football specific conditioning, but again, it's four seconds, full speed, rest interval. We don't run, we test our, I used to test 300 yard shuttles at the end of summer division. But I don't like doing it because the month of July is about power for us. And why do I want to run 300 yard shuttles two days a week if I'm trying to improve power? So we test that at the end of June. Okay, and about middle of June is what's going to be this year. Now, if you don't pass it, you're going to run it. Sorry. I mean, you're going to run that sucker the whole month of July because the most important thing to us is your accountability and your discipline as a football player and your accountability to your teammates. But ideally, and we, we have maybe one or two guys that do it last year, but ideally, that's the template we work from. Then you've got to plug in what exercises, what exercises do you believe are important, what exercises do you feel comfortable coaching. It might be snatches, it might be clean jerks, it might be hex bar, it might be squat jumps, whatever it is that you feel comfortable as a coach. Okay, so I don't know if we have time for questions or not. But we'll questions? <laughs> questions like in between. Okay. We do. Let's get Aaron. Right.